So the first reading will be First John, chapter one, verse one, until two, verse two. For those who have the Bibles, um, you can flip it up. Otherwise, the passage is on the screen. So lucky you. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous, And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The second one will be at the same chap, um, it's the same book, First John, one John, but it's at chapter three, verse sixteen, and we'll later read verse twenty-three. Why is it not the screen? Oh, right, (laughs) right. So verse sixteen. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another, just as he has commanded us. The last bit will be at chapter 5, verse 11 to 12. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Okay, well, welcome to the evening session again. Uh, I'm excited to be here and getting stuck into one, John. And it's, it's encouraging when you get up to preach, to know that everyone's read through the book that you'll be preaching from at least once. So I'm sure you're all primed, and I've, I've spied a few questions that have been on a public space up on the wall, and obviously you guys are asking um, some hard questions of the, of the Bible, which is really good, and really trying to understand it. And uh, in these talks, Tim and I will not be looking at every chapter and verse of 1 John, but we'll be looking at key themes that hold the book of John together. And hopefully as we go through it this way, um, it will be obvious why we're doing it in that way. It's part of how 1 John works as a book, actually, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, I'll just get myself organised here. Well, I'm getting organised. You can get organised and turn to page 37 of your booklets. If you haven't already done that, you'll find there... The outline, the beginning of the outline for the one John talks, Uh, if you want to use the unmarked or the beginning to be marked manuscript of one John, you can turn to that in your booklets or I think, are we allowed to have Bibles? Uh, I think we're allowed to have flicking Bibles uh, during these sessions. Um, So you have to stick to your manuscript in your small groups, but you can flick around. I will be looking at some other parts of the Bible, particularly John's gospel, actually, the the prequel, you could see it that way, to 1 John, or the background of 1 John. So it could be handy to have a Bible or a device handy. That would be good. Uh, as I said at the beginning, my first summit was in 1991. I've been on 25 summits. I think I counted before, including when I was a student. But one of the most memorable ones was my first one. I still remember it, 1991, of course. 
It's a very important year. Uh, does anyone know who Nirvana are? Yeah, they released Smells Like Teen Spirit in that year. That's an historic year. More importantly, Bob Dylan turned 50 in 1991. That's pretty exciting. I used to think that that was really old, but it's starting to seem not that old anymore. It was the first year I uh, looked, well, for me, it was a huge year because uh, it was like the lights being turned on and God's word just hit me between the eyes as God's word. And part of that cumulative experience was looking at one John in detail on Summit. So, I, you know, if I, if I get a bit emotional at times or having flashbacks, uh, you'll understand. Or maybe I'm just getting emotional. That, that happens as well sometimes. Um, that wasn't a joke, so I'm glad he didn't laugh. It's serious. Sometimes I just get emotional and, you know, it just happens. But I do actually have the Summit booklet from 1991. I dug. Yes. It's a collector's item. So it... Ah. <laughs> So you can't smell the internet yet, but you can. Of course, printed on uh, papyrus, which was what we used at the time. And I noticed that the manuscript discovery, what translation? It's in the original Greek. Uh, Oh, there is a translation. Oh, it's the Latin translation. So, you know, a few things were different. Some it was called the AFES Area Conference, so areas as in states, because there was only one summit for the whole of Victoria, and there were 90 people on that summit, and so that was Latrobe, Monash, RMIT, uh, actually RMIT didn't exist as a CU group at that point, and uh, you know, Vic, Vic Uni was only a twinkle in, in its mother's eye at the time, as my dad used to say, I'm not sure what that means, but he used to say that... <laughs> But uh, yes, uh, it, it's the, the timetable is handwritten in sort of cartoon form, which was something that our camp director at the time uh, liked to do. It's, it's got the songs the music team might like to look later on. It's got the, uh, the songs that we sung printed out in English, which is good. And um, prayer points for IFES. So it's good we were praying for missionaries then. We um, not praying for uh, Slovenia at that point, but we are now. So that's we've rectified that problem. Brano would be pleased to know. But yes, if you'd like to look at an ancient artifact, you can uh, look. I could regale you with tales of yore for all night, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to pull out a few seminal moments from my first year at uni. Probably the Christmas, I think. After summit, I used to go regularly to the country where my uh, uh, uncle used to live. We used to have uh, Christmas there. And I remember having a conversation uh, with my uncle. There was something in the Age newspaper about debating whether the God of Islam was the same as the God of Christianity. And that, you know, because I'd been on one summit, of course, I was a theological expert. And that led to me trying to sort my uncle out. But I remember him very plainly saying to me, look, Andy, you've been on this conference. You're a little bit fired up. I understand that. When, when you get older, you know, when you turn 46, um, just how old I am now, uh, when, when you get a bit older and, and grey, you, you realise that it's actually more about shades of, of grey. It's, it's not black and white. It, it's, it's more, it's more grey. It's, 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 yeah, you'll settle down. You'll understand that. I remember that conversation distinctly. I remember another conversation I had in the next year when I was at CU. I um, was talking to the Archbishop's chaplain, which you might think is a weird thing to do. I didn't just sort of ring him up and say, I'd like to talk to you. It was, it was to t- think about whether or not I should get ordained. And he was very curious about the fact that I was an evangelical and part of this sort of this conservative Bible-believing group. And, but he, he was very charming. He said, look, you, you evangelicals, you, you sort of... Uh, he didn't use the word fundamentalist, but you evangelical Christians, you bring them in, you, you convert them, but we, we mature them. That's what we do. We, we, we mature them. It's sort of more sophisticated, some might say liberal theology. It's nuance over certainty. It's mystery. It's mystery over clarity. Uh, another series of conversations I remember having when someone was first willing to, to pay me to, to do ministry. I was a, a youth worker and uh, a question that I would often get asked when we were having discussions 
And uh, this is a, just a classic was, you know, can, Andy, can you be a Christian and still go out with a non-Christian? Or can you be a Christian and still swear? Or can you be a Christian and still get drunk occasionally on Friday night? It was all, it was sort of, you know, how, how can I go so far with Christianity but not let go of the way I'm living my life and, and the kind of priorities I have? Can Andy, tell me how I can fit these things together. And it struck me as I was reading through 1 John, I did, I actually checked my notes and, and I, to my shame, there isn't enough scribble on, on the pages there. They're a bit too blank. Maybe I just didn't know what was going on. I was a bit too excited or something. But in my first sort of gut reaction thing there, I've written, what's your gut reaction to 1 John? I've, I've written, he's very black and white. And I actually read that after I'd, I don't know if you guys have found that, um, there's all these polarities. And I found that again as I was preparing these talks uh, this year. Um, it's, it's uh, it, you know, my, I've still got an issue with, with what my uncle was trying to say to me, because when I read 1 John, uh, it is black and white. It's a book filled with polarities, which of course is because John bases his teaching on the teaching of Jesus, whose teaching was full of polarities. One writer calls John, uh, describes John's implacability and absolutism. It's either this or it's this. So for example, God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. It's not God's a little bit light and a little bit dark. No, God is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. Or a person walks in the light or they walk in the dark. They don't walk in the twilight. It's either they walk in the light or in the dark. A person either believes in the truth about the Lord Jesus or is deceived by lies. They believe lies. I read that in 1 John. A person's in fellowship with God's people or they're not. You can't be sort of part of God's people. A person either keeps God's commandments and his word, that's what they do, or they don't. A person either loves their brother or sister in Christ or hates their brother or sister, or hates uh, believers. A person either loves the Father or loves the world. You, uh, not at the same. Is hated by the world or loved by the world. Is for Christ or is antichrist. Is a child of God or is a child of the world and of the devil. Have you heard these polarities as you've been reading through? A, a person either confesses the Son, has the Spirit, and so is a child of the Father. Or denies the son and does not and is not. A person is either righteous and practices righteousness because they belong to God, or is unrighteous and practices sin or lawlessness because they belong to the devil. A person either abides in God through Jesus or does not. A person is either alive to God or is dead to God. A person has the spirit of God and so life or doesn't. There's a spirit of Christ at work in teaching and in teachers and the spirits of Antichrist at work in others. There is the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. A person is from God or from the world. John says, whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever doesn't, doesn't. A person has life in God or is dead in sin. A person is no longer fearful, particularly of judgment, or is fearful. A person knows the Father through the Son by the Spirit, or a person worships idols. It's very black and white, light or dark, truth or lies, love or hate, Christ or antichrist, children of God, children of the devil, love for God or love for the world, love, life of righteousness, life of sin, life or death. And as I was reading it, it actually reminded me of the implacable and absolutist questions that Adults who present for Christian baptism in the denomination that I've been part of for many years, the Anglican Church, are asked uh, before God and his church. Listen to these absolute questions. These are the questions you, you are asked if you present for baptism. Do you turn to Christ? Do you repent of your sins? Do you renounce evil, the devil and all his works? Then after saying one of the great historic summaries of the, the Christian faith, the historic biblical Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed, along together with the rest of the church, you're asked, do you profess this faith? 
Will you, with God's help, strive to keep his holy will and commandments and serve him faithfully throughout your life? And just to be sure, at the end of that, you want to go through with it. Do you seek baptism into this faith that you have professed? Because you see, the thing about repentance is that it's about doing the 180, the, the, the about face. You're walking in this direction. Your life is, is away from God, walking away from God. And, all, and you do the about face. You go in a completely other direction. And it's very hard to face two directions at the same time. You can't do it. That's why the interview was a bit confusing before. No offense to the interview. Because you can't place two. You can't. You're either this way or that. Do you see how that works? You can't face two directions unless you're some creature from Greek mythology at the same time you can't do it you can only face one way at one time you are either for Christ or antichrist so you think about faith trust and trusting your life your 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 salvation to Christ is that speaks of an exclusive relationship just as repentance is, is about going in a new direction, our, our faith in Christ is, is exclusive. It's, it's, it's an exclusive relationship. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I've got a quote there from Don Carson. And, and this is his reflection as he comes out of the absolutism of one John. He, he, he says, look, Christianity is not infinitely plastic, malleable, stretchy, rubbery. It embraces truth, the denial of which proves that one is simply not a Christian. It defines conduct, the systematic flouting of which demonstrates one is outside the camp. You see, Jesus is an absolutist. You read Luke's gospel and there's only two categories of people in the world. You're either lost or found, aren't you? You, you can't be a little bit lost and a little bit found, you're either lost or found. If you read John's gospel, you're either dead or alive. You're either a slave to sin or you've been set free by Jesus. You're either a child of God or a child of the devil. Many of the themes that are picked up in 1 John. You can't have a little bit of, of Jesus. You can't be a little bit Christian. That wasn't very Christian of me. Is, a, is an odd statement. It's a telling statement. Jesus declared himself not to be air freshener. Air freshener is good. It's handy. It improves the quality of life. You know, many of you have certain flatmates who've spent long periods of time in, in the smallest room in the house. You're glad of air freshener or you wish you had some or you, at least a box of matches or just something <laughs> to help you survive when you need to go in and do what needs to be done straight after. But you could live without it. And let's face it, many of you do. You put up with that disgusting stench. No, you, you, you can do it. You can live without air freshener. Some people see Jesus like that. If, if, if I follow Jesus, it would enhance life. It would add something to my life. No, Jesus didn't declare himself to be air freshener, but oxygen. Apart from me, you have no life in you. He used words like lost, blind, deaf, dead. But then he said, in me, you have light. Life, truth, love. God goes all in with the world through Jesus. He doesn't just dip his toe in the water. He is really God with us and he really is fully man, God in the flesh. He really did die and he really was buried. Not like those TAC ads, not a little bit dead. You know, we all know from the ads, you can't be a little bit dead. He was dead. And he really did rise from the dead, not just in our hearts. No, we're not talking anemic, flat tired Jesus of liberalism and the cults. No, he was dead and then he was alive. And really only one response uh, is called for in response to that. Chapter 3, verse 23, I'm, I'm going to read out, which will confuse you all as you go through your columns. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. 1 John tells us that we can be certain. 
we can be certain. I desperately want to be certain about a whole range of things. At the moment, this will sort of reveal to you where I'm at. I, I, I'd like to be certain that my kids will get through school relatively unscathed. That's where I'm at at the moment. But none of us really knows what's going to happen when we lie down to sleep tonight or wake up in the morning. If we wake up, there's only one thing that we can have absolute certainty about. But thank God it's the most important thing. How we can be made alive to God. How we can have life in God, with God, forever. And you'll know now, because you've read through all of 1 John, that this is why John writes to these guys. He's got a number of pastoral reasons why he wants them to be assured of this. Uh, But in chapter 5, verse 13, one of the great purpose statements of 1 John, these things I've written to you, when anyone writes... When you read that in the Bible, you think, oh, okay, we're about to find out why this letter was written. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. John wants people, Christians, to be certain that they have life. But why should we trust John? Is it possible to have certainty about anything, let alone eternal life? Well, I'm I'm glad you asked. Can we trust God? Uh, John. Uh, And to find the answer, we need to go back to the beginning, which is the great theologian Julie Andrews and the Sound of Music reminds us is a very good place to start. (laughs) Yes, it is. And when I say beginning, I mean the beginning. So let's have a look. At one John, what was I'm going to, and just to mess with your minds even more, I'm going to use a slightly different translation. What this is the very start of one John. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was revealed, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's very important to know who is writing you a letter. Maybe you don't get uh, many letters these days, but uh, you still, I still get stuff in the letterbox. And if it's something with a, with a bank that I don't bank with, um, that's sort of, and I open it up and it's talking about, you know, I, I, we can extend your credit limit. I know what to do with that letter straight away. I put it in the, the circular file. I put it straight into recycling. That's what I do with that letter. But if, if I got a letter, let's say more realistically, a letter from um, my father and I knew it was his handwriting and he'd signed off giving me some important news that he, he, he thought that he needed to put down in writing, that would be a letter that I would pay attention to. I wouldn't be as quick to recycle that letter. I'd I'd, I'd be carefully pondering that letter. Well, with 1 John, the earliest manuscripts are unanimous, as are the church fathers from Irenaeus onwards, and he died in 200 AD, that the same person who wrote John's gospel wrote 1 John. And of course, blind Freddy could tell that just from one reading of the letter in terms of its style and its feel and its vocab and it's, it's theological emphases. And who is John? According to John's gospel, the beloved disciple of Jesus, an apostle, an eye, ear and hand witness. That is, this guy was able and probably did give Jesus, gave Jesus a hug, right? This is remarkable. What our hands have touched. That's what we're talking about here. And he, he testifies to Jesus who through his words and deeds, as all the Gospels unanimously declare, was revealed to be the very revelation of God. God exegeted, God in the flesh, God incarnate, the word of life, the eternal life, which was always with God, not just from the beginning of Jesus' ministry or this letter, but from the beginning, from eternity. Echoes here of Genesis 1, which is then echoed by John 1. In the beginning, God, who is, who has been revealed now to be Father, Son 
and Holy Spirit. John says that it's, this is who we're talking about. That one, Jesus. Remember my gospel, guys? What did he write there? The word who was with God, who is God, the true light, the life of God, the one who is full of grace and truth, the one who made the, the invisible God visible. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him both before he died and even more significantly, they, he did all of those things after Jesus rose from the dead. And I'm going to take my jumper off because I'm getting a bit hot. It's a bit hot out here and it's going to... Two, two testing. Is that working now? Is that... Yep, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Comic relief. Okay, let's get back into it. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him, both before he died and even more significantly after he rose from the dead. But Andy, says my uncle, there are so many different religions. If only one of them is true, why isn't God clear about that? Newsflash, he is clear. The mystery is dispelled. We can't use ignorance as an excuse. And if you're a Christian, John says, you know Jesus, you know he is the way, the truth. And here in 1 John, especially 1 John 1, the life. You've received these truths about Jesus by the power of his spirit. Chapter 2, verse 20, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know, you know the truth. And this is the truth. The life was revealed, it appeared, eternal life which belongs to the Father, which is in the Son and which was revealed to us. In the first instance, the apostles and the other eyewitnesses. And John writes to these guys what we have seen and heard and touched we proclaim to you also. Ah, but Andy, what if they made a mistake? What if, what if it's all a big mistake? Well, do you think God's going to leave something as important as this up to chance? Well, it doesn't really matter what we think. What did Jesus promise? And this is where I'm going to go into John's gospel. You can flick around if you want to, or you can look up the references later. Jesus talks about what uh, he will continue to do by the Holy Spirit uh, after he has been raised from the dead. He says, this is John fourteen twenty six. but the advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So see there the Holy Spirit guaranteeing and enabling the apostles' ministry as they would continue to bear witness, the witness that we receive now in the Scriptures. He says it again in a different way in John 15, verse 26. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, this is John 15, 26, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. So John and the other apostles didn't get up and say, oh, maybe we should tell people about Jesus. This is Jesus' idea, right? That the eyewitnesses, the people who were closest to him, who were there from the beginning, people like John would bear witness, but not just on their own strength. Notice it's the spirit of truth testifying through the actual testimony, which is now a written human word to us. Uh, chapter 16, it comes out again. John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, Jesus says, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. To you, the Spirit's great spotlight ministry, explaining and proclaiming Jesus through the testimony of the apostles. And then we read in chapter 17, 20, Jesus has prayed for the apostles and then he prays for all of us. That is people who would believe in the future. And he writes, my prayer, or he says rather, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Real human eye, ear and hand witness testimony enabled, guaranteed, preserved by the Spirit of God, authorised by the Lord Jesus who sends the Spirit, with the Father sends the Spirit that leads him into all the truth about his Son 
through the witness of those who've been with him from the beginning. The truth that the first readers of this letter and the 10 trillion millionth readers, whoever we happen to be, I'm not sure, have in this book, in the Bible. This is Christ authored, spirit backed, apostolic, historic Christianity. This is the Christian faith. This is the true faith of the church. But John, those teachers we're telling you about, they, they, they sort of understood all that at the start, but, but they've got some special ideas. that They seem to have got this anointing and they've got this idea that maybe Jesus didn't come in the flesh and they say our theology is a bit sort of earthly and unsophisticated and we're missing out on this special um, theology and, and experience that, and we're on the wrong side of history. And, we're, and John says in response, <laughs> which when translated is, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son doesn't have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. 1 John 2, verses 22 and 23. But why? Why did John proclaim that? Maybe this is where we'll get to this in, the insidious thing. No one ever does anything for nothing. Maybe what did, what did the apostles have to gain out of this? What was in it for them? Well, for most of them, martyrdom, actually. <laughs> they gave their lives. False teaching and, and cults are ultimately about centralizing power in human beings and human movements. It's about control. It's about manipulation. It's about taking Christ and his apostles were not of that character. His people, Christ and his people are on about love, as we're going to keep learning this week. They're on about giving their own lives. Why does John proclaim this message? He tells us in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. What brings him joy? What makes God truly happy? What, what are the angels rejoicing about in heaven? What did Jesus teach us? What makes God's people joyful? When others come to share in the love and life of God's family, that fellowship, which is not only sharing in the love and life of God's family with all of our new brothers and sisters, but as we heard this morning from John 17 and here again here means sharing in the love and life of God himself. Above all else, I think one John is a love letter from God to his people that they may go on confidently bathing in, living out the family likeness, the life of love, like father, like child. According to Christ's apostle, according to John, eternal life is about being known by and knowing and sharing in God's love together with all of his people Forever. That's what eternal life is for, for enjoying that relationship. Remember the talk this morning, relationship. It, it's, it's not accidental. It's at the heart of God's plans for the universe. It's, it's the most real thing. And that's what makes John, that's what makes us, I hope, truly rejoice. Fellowship with God and, and others who are inviting to share in that through the gospel more about that actually in Tim's talk on Wednesday night when he talks about the incredible privilege that fellowship is but I want to come back to how John writes now I wonder from your reading so far if you've noticed particularly if if you're you've been a read a bit of Paul you know uh, yeah we did didn't we we looked at 1 Corinthians this semester the way that he writes maybe compared to how John writes Um, here's how Constantine Campbell, otherwise known as Con Campbell, puts it. And um, 
He writes, John's core convictions about God, Jesus Christ, humanity, truth and love are all interrelated and fold back on each other in a recursive fashion. John's rich tapestry demands that we see it's woven together fully all picture of God in Christ. At a staff meeting, uh, Julianne said, one John is the Bible book for art students. And there are a lot of art student words being used here. I'm going to be a, a little bit, now it's, it's actually a book for everyone. Even if you're not an art student, then that's okay. You know, I, that's all right. But I, I, just, I just want to get a little bit arty for a moment, if I can. For me, reading 1 John is like looking at the painting of Turner. Well, I, I think one of the greatest impressionists of all time. You, you, if you get r- right up close, it's just like all these blobs and stuff. And it doesn't really make sense. And it's like, where does it start? And where did it, you've, got to, you've got to stand back. You got to, and these colours swirl around and connect in, and you're not sure where they begin and where they 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 end. You, you, you've got to, I think you've got to do that with one John. You, you've got to, John wants you to hear these truths again and again, and as he takes you deeper into them, he wants you to marinate in them. He wants, he wants you to see how they inform and connect to each other, how they fit together. John's painting a picture of what life in Christ looks like. How it's expressed. How is that life of love expressed? And what is it that makes it possible? And there are these descriptions that reverberate again and again. But it's quite annoying, actually, listening to someone trying to describe a painting. You've actually got to look at the painting. And, and for us, we need to listen, don't we? Um, looking at the Bible is listening carefully. So let's, let's look at the painting again. Chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How can you spot a genuine Christian much in the same way that you can spot a genuine Mick Jagger. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the lead singer of the Rolling Stones at work. He sort of, he sort of does, he's a strut, you know. He learned it all off James Brown, but I, I can't do it. I can't do it because I'm not Mick Jagger. But that's, you can tell me as soon as he comes out, that's Mick. Yay, that's, he's just, ooh, he's, he's rocking and he's into it. You tell him by his walk. That's how you tell Mick Jagger, by his walk. That's how you, that's how you tell a Christian. I'm not sure if that illustration worked, but I'm going to keep going with it. <laughs> by their walk, their way of life. Their, their walk, their way of life is consistent. It's a true reflection of God's revealed truth about himself. A, a true reflection of his character. The children of God, John says, take on the family likeness. Of their heavenly father. They walk in the light as he is in the light. The light of God as it's revealed in the Lord Jesus, who is the truth, who is the light. Interesting uh, fact about 1 John that before the letter tells us famously that God is love, in chapter 4, verse 16, and a few other places, I think, or at least one other place in chapter 4, it first tells us that God is light. In chapter 1, verse 5, that in him there is no darkness at all. And of course, you don't need me to tell you that God is love is one of the most popular, but also one of the most abused statements that's taken out of context from the Bible. Hey, don't be judgmental, man. Don't harp on about sexual purity, man, because God is love. Just love, man. Everything will be all right. Like the prophet said, all you need is love. Love wins, right? Wrong. God wins. We don't understand what God is love means. And we don't first understand that we're not talking about some free form, loosey goosey sentimentality, right? Filling the gaps with the spirit of the age. No, God's love grows out of his truth. The truth of who God is in his perfect holiness. It's not an indulgent love, endlessly plastic It's a merciful love. It's a love that doesn't turn a blind eye to the destructive power of sin, the destruction that sin wreaks on our relationships. It doesn't turn a blind eye to that, to the affront that sin is to God's righteous and holy character and purposes. 
God, because of his holy love, this book teaches us, must judge all sin, all lawlessness. Sin leads to death, 1 John teaches us. But in God's holy love, perfect justice is met by perfect mercy and forgiveness, as we will see shortly in the death of Jesus on the cross. Here's a theologian from an earlier time. He he writes, if we spoke less about God's love and more about his holiness, we should say much more when we did speak about his love. Well, John wants to talk about God's holiness and God's love in equal measure. But I I get the point of what Forsyth is saying there. So maybe as one John scholars, you might prefer to say we we truly get chapter 4, verse 16. If we've first read chapter 1, verse 5, God is light, which comes first in the letter. So the Christian life is characterized by men and women who walk in a new way. Remember, you can't walk in two directions at the same time, who walk in the light of Christ. They live lives that on a daily basis are seeking to conform to his truth, lives that take on the family likeness, the character of Christ. But what is the source of this life? When sin is so prevalent, when we know our hearts are deceitful above all things, when when sin just keeps spewing out of us, when we know that left to ourselves we are greedy, we are proud, I do envy other people. I am spiteful. I do covet things that other people have and I don't give thanks to what I have been given. Where where does this come from? If all this is true, if Jesus' diagnosis about the human condition, which is unanimously shared by the New Testament, is right, then what is the source of this life? How is our sin dealt with? Well, John thankfully tells us plainly, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar And his word is not in us. Anyone here prepared to say that God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit is a liar? Sin is lawlessness. All wrongdoing is sin. And we are all guilty. Christians are the ultimate realists. We believe the truth about ourselves according to God. I can't see into the depths of my heart or your heart. I, I'm, sadly, I'm very easily impressed by veneers and cover-ups, but God does. And he calls me to share this verdict of myself, and he calls you as well, not so that we remain condemned, which is what I deserve, what you deserve, but so that we might be forgiven and cleansed of all our guilt, that we might stand spotless before his throne. How does God do this? Does he become indulgent all of a sudden and and say, well, it doesn't matter anymore. I I won't talk about it if you don't talk about it. Live and let live and let live. No, God is not your mate down at the pub peering out of his beer goggles. You know, yeah, it's all good, mate. No, it's not like that. Sin matters. John says he writes so that his readers might not sin, but walk in the light of life, might choose life, might obey God, might enjoy and share in his love in real and practical ways. But we can only do that because of his grace to us first in Christ. Listen to chapter two again. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? 
God assumed he took on our punishment within himself. Jesus, the righteous one, the only truly righteous one who never sinned, in whom is no sin, represented us by dying as a human being, a man, bearing the sin of humankind, mankind in his body, so that God's wrath, that is his measured, just and holy judgment, was taken from us and placed on him. Jesus bore God's wrath and anger and paid the penalty of death as our substitute so that God's wrath was propitiated, turned away, appeased. That's the word that lies behind that sacrifice of atonement language. And it happened through the sacrifice, the one perfect and complete sacrifice of Christ. So that as God's wrath was turned away, propitiated, our sin was expiated, it was expunged, it was washed away. So that in him and by him our sin is forgiven and we are cleansed. He took our sin. He gave us his perfect law-fulfilling righteousness. People become Christians on summit. Um, and I don't know all of you here, and, and there may be people here yet who haven't thanked God for that or haven't understood that, that trusting in Jesus as our saviour in that way is what it means to be a Christian. So I thought at this point it would be good after talking about Jesus' death to ask the question, how do I become a Christian? Well, I acknowledge that God's verdict about me is true. And I acknowledge that what God says about his son, the Lord Jesus, is true. And I put my faith, I stop putting my faith in myself, my feeble efforts. I put my, put my faith, I put my confidence, I put my trust in Jesus. I say thank you. That's what I do for this gift of forgiveness, this gift of cleansing. I receive this gift that God gives me in his son, the Lord Jesus. And I walk on living a new life, as, as we'll hear more and more about this week, a new life of love as one of God's beloved children, as part of God's family. So let me ask you, do you believe that God is telling the truth about you and his son tonight? Can I ask the baptismal question? Do you turn to Christ? Do you renounce evil? then what are you waiting for? It's time to say thank you. Stop stalling. Not because I'm telling you to, but because God is in his word. Listen, hear again the word of the Lord. I'm going to jump over to chapter 5 and verse 11 and uh, some of these invitations here. The witness is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So back to chapter 3, verse 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, in all that Jesus is and claims to be and what he has achieved for us. We believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Do you believe in the Son? Do you want to live and not die? All you have to do is ask, is pray. Uh, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to pray. And if that's your prayer, uh, please pray with me. Father God, these are not just, uh, this is not just an academic exercise. These are the words of life. Jesus, your son, is our only hope, our only saviour. We acknowledge tonight, Lord God, uh, that we need your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for 
forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for your death for me. Please help me to trust in you, to know this life and to live in your love. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you prayed then, please come and talk to me or someone else up the front or just someone in your small group about that. I also want to, I don't want to rush on from that, but I do want to give an application if you are a Christian. So what do we do when we sin? Do we try and cleanse ourselves? Do we, do we, do we make ourselves feel better by doing lots of good things? Do we just try harder or do we hide it? Do we bury our sin deep down? No, our advocate before the Father is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So what do we do? Well, we come again boldly into God's presence. In Jesus' name, we confess our sin to him. Whatever it is, we trust in him. We receive the fresh start that he promises us. We stay in fellowship with God's people. We remain accountable to each other. We encourage each other to keep walking in that direction. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Bonhoeffer wrote, Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness and the seclusion of the heart. Since the confession of sin is made in the presence of a Christian brother or sister, the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned. The sinner gives their heart to God. They find forgiveness of all their sin and the fellowship of Christ and his people. In confession, it's handed over to God. It's been taken away from him. Now he stands in the fellowship of sinners who live by the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ. So tonight someone here is struggling perhaps with pornography. Tonight someone here perhaps is struggling with the, they're feeling the weight of a conversation they've had, things that they said that they wish they hadn't said to a brother or sister in Christ. Don't don't stand defeated. Don't don't stand condemned. Don't have secret sins. Please don't become comfortable with your sin. Do acknowledge it. Do bring it to the cross. Do claim Christ's love and mercy and forgiveness. Do declare his forgiveness to one another. The love and mercy and forgiveness we all need. We all only live by the grace of God and the cross of Jesus. Well, leading up to Summit, there have been a number of contenders for the best love song ever. I think I've found the, 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 the winner, though. Uh, it's a song by Cole Porter, so it's actually even older than the 1960s. And uh, the chorus is, what is this thing called love? And I like it because you can say that in lots of different ways. Um, uh, what is this thing called love? What is this thing called love? What is this thing called love? I mean, you can, yeah, it's, it's got this ambiguity to it. But what is this thing called love? This funny thing called love? Who can solve its mystery? Why should it make a fool of me? I saw you there one wonderful day. You took my heart and threw it away. That's why I asked the Lord in heaven above. What is this thing called love? Well, the Lord in heaven tells us plainly. 1 John 3.16. This is the last verse I want to share from 1 John tonight. This is how we know what love is. So wherever you've come from tonight, wherever you're at, however you're, whatever you've come to summit um, thinking about, I, I, I want each of us to know this for ourselves tonight. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay it down our lives down for our brothers and sisters. Jesus gave all. The only thing he took from us was our sin and judgment. This is a love that saves us. This is a love that sets us free to live 
a new life in him. One final quote from William Tyndale. He was the guy who provided us with the first complete translation of the Bible in English. And once he'd done that, he only had time to write two commentaries before he was martyred at the age of 46, which it, this, this number keeps coming up. It's a bit sobering. He only had time to write two commentaries. What, what would you choose to write on first? Well, he chose the Sermon on the Mount. That's pretty good. I think that's pretty good. Matthew 5 to 7 and 1 John which he called the Epistle of Love, which I think is a good subtitle for John. He wrote the commentary in 1531. Tyndale knew what being a Christian is all about. This was the gospel of love that he lived and died for. And I'll finish with a quote from him before we pray. We deserve not the love of God first, but he deserves our love and he loves us first to win us and to make us his friends rather than remain his enemies. And as soon as we believe his love, we love again. And so faith in Christ is mother of all love. When we believe his love, we love again. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your amazing love for us in Jesus. And his death for us. And Father, as we continue to plumb the depths of the reality of that love this week, please continue to show us your love and what it means for us to know this love and respond to this love and live in this love, even as we live and share together this week. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.